Good morning. My name is Michelle, and I will be your conference operator today. At this time, I would like to welcome everyone to the L Brand Second Quarter 2020 Earnings Conference Call. Please be advised that today's conference is being recorded. All participants are in a listen-only mode until the question and answer session at the end of today's presentation. To ask a question at that time, press star 1. I would now like to turn the call over to Ms. Amy Preston, Chief Investor Relations Office of L Brand. You may begin. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning and welcome to Outbrand's second quarter earnings conference call for the period ending August 1st, 2020. As a matter of formality, I need to remind you that any forward-looking statements we may make today are subject to our safe harbor statements found in our SEC filings and in our press releases. Joining me on the call today are Andrew Meslow, CEO of Out Brands, and Stuart Bergdorfer, Interim CEO of Victoria's Secret and CFO of Out Brands. All results we discuss on the call today are adjusted results and exclude the special items described in our press release. Thanks, and now I'll turn the call over to Andrew. Thanks, Amy, and good morning, everyone. The second quarter of 2020 continued to be an unprecedented time for the world, for the retail industry, and for our business. Our first priority was and continues to be the safety of our associates and customers as we reopened the majority of our stores in the second quarter. We adopted new operating models in all of our stores that focused on providing a safe shopping experience. Additionally, we focused on our distribution, fulfillment, and call center safety, and maximizing our direct businesses. Overall, we delivered strong results in the second quarter, and we could not have done so without the hard work and dedication of all associates across our business. In stores, distribution and fulfillment centers, call centers, and home offices. On behalf of the company, I'd like to express our deep appreciation for all of their efforts. During the second quarter, we also took a number of important steps to prepare Victoria's Secret and Bath & Body Works to operate as standalone separate companies, improve L Brand's profitability, maintain liquidity during the pandemic, and maximize our financial performance, all of which we outlined in the earnings commentary that we released last night. As we also discussed in last night's commentary, despite our strong results in the second quarter, we do expect results to moderate, and for a number of reasons, we have a cautious outlook for the second half of the year. We won't repeat those prepared comments this morning in order to leave more time for all of your questions. Thanks, and back over to you, Amy. Thanks, Andrew. That concludes our prepared comments, and at this time, we'd be happy to take any questions you might have. In the interest of time and consideration to others, Please limit yourself to one question. Thanks, and now I'll turn it back over to the operator. Thank you. Our first question will come from Ike Burrowshaw from Wells Fargo. Your line is now open. One moment, please. You mentioned in the press release about bankers being hired for, for the VS uh, transaction. Can you give us an update on timing of, of when you guys are expecting? So, IQ, caught out, you cut out there a little bit, but I think we got the gist of that. So we're going to turn it over to Stuart. Good morning, Ike, and, and uh, those listening. So, you know, our view on uh, our activities related to the, the separation of the businesses, you know, first as, as outlined in our circulated script and as, as uh, Andrew reminded us this morning, we took important steps uh, to create uh, or, or to facilitate standalone companies, Victoria's Secret and Bath and Body Works in the quarter. That was the organizational work that we did, uh, taking many uh, shared functions and uh, uh, creating uh, uh, or integrating those functions, I should say, into the respective businesses, Victoria's Secret and, and Bath and Body Works. Um, we did uh, retain uh, Goldman and J.P. Morgan uh, uh, very recently, uh, shortly after the end of the quarter, 
and we'll begin work with them where they'll give uh, the board and, and the company advice about uh, the range of alternatives uh, and will assist us in a process as we, as we move forward. Obviously, it's important to uh, get a read on uh, holiday results uh, to value the business and to ensure that, that we strike the right balance uh, in terms of uh, timing, execution risk, uh, and getting an appropriate valuation uh, for the business. And what the company is most focused on right now is driving great results at retail. So we've got a lot of people in stores, distribution centers, home offices, uh, vendor partners, all kinds of uh, folks uh, organized to provide the best results at retail, and I couldn't be more proud of what this team has done over the last 90 days or so through the organizational work, reopening stores, maximizing volume on the digital channel and the digital channel. So we're very focused on having the best holiday possible. Uh, it'll be important as we as we go down this path, and uh, it'll be important input, um, you know, as, as capital markets, advisors, potential buyers, uh, again, uh, the public markets assess uh, the opportunity for Victoria's Secret. So uh, very focused on having a good holiday, have hired some banks, and took a lot of important steps to, to uh, create standalone companies. Thanks, Ike. Thanks, George. Thanks, Ike. Next question, please. Our next question will come from Matthew Boss from J.P. Morgan. Your line is now open. Great, thanks, and congrats on a nice quarter. On, on the expected moderation and trend for the back half of the year that you cited, have you, see, have you actually seen a material deceleration in trend at either of your concepts to date? And coming out of the pandemic, curious your confidence in Bath & Body Works and being a stronger business model. Maybe you can touch on customer acquisition trends more recently. Okay. Thanks, Matt. We're going to start with Stuart and then go to Andrew. So with respect to, to very recent results, uh, we have not at VS Nuco, and we'll speak to Bath & Body, we at VS Nuco have not seen any change in trend, any deceleration of trend over the last several weeks. I realize other retailers have reported on that. We have not seen that in the VS Nuco result. Hi, Matthew. Uh, so similar to what Stuart just described, uh, Bath & Body Works had very strong and consistent results uh, throughout Q2. Uh, and as we got more and more stores open uh, through the end of the quarter, finishing with essentially uh, the majority of stores uh, open and sitting here now today in uh, mid-August, we actually have all but about 40 stores reopened. We've continued to see very strong results in both our direct channel and our stores channel. And as we've moved into August, uh, we've seen results continue to be very strong. In terms of your question around our future confidence in Bath & Body Works, I would say there also uh, we, we have uh, a lot of, of belief that our trend should be able to continue uh, as a strong market leader in all of the categories in which we play. As you can imagine, as we've discussed in the past, one of the most critical questions we always ask ourselves is, are we, in fact, in the right categories of business? And are those categories that are still relevant to our customers and growing in the marketplace? And I think it's fair to say that in the case of Bath & Body Works, the answer to that question is a strong yes across our entire portfolio. Obviously, the soap and sanitizer business that historically has been 14 to 15 percent of the business is uh, even more important to our customers and to, uh, to all of the country right now in the midst of a pandemic. So as expected, we've seen tremendous growth coming out of that category. And while that may moderate over time, we expect that uh, awareness around the importance of that uh, category, washing your hands, using sanitizers when you're not able to wash your hands, will continue even as the pandemic itself hopefully starts to wane away. In terms of our other categories, we obviously have a huge and, and important body care business. That business has always been relevant to our customers, is even more relevant to her today as an affordable luxury, a way for her to treat herself even when she's uh, unable or unwilling to, uh, to spend money on perhaps other larger ticket commodities. 
Uh, that is a, an inexpensive way, whether for self-indulgence or to give as a gift. And then similarly, our, our uh, important home fragrance business that has grown substantially over the last half decade, also tremendously important to her, both now during the pandemic, when we're using our homes as uh, a place of work, a place of, of teaching and school, uh, and a place of, of refuge and solace, uh, certainly making your home smell like you want it to is, is something that our customer has continued to express interest in and, again, something we would expect to continue through the pandemic and also afterwards. So, again, bottom line, categories that we're in very, very relevant today have been relevant in the past and we absolutely believe are just as relevant to go forward. That helps. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Matt. Next question, please. Our next question will come from Simeon Siegel with BMO Capital Markets. Your line is open. Thanks. Good morning, everyone, and congrats on the impressive results, even environment aside. Um, Stuart, could you quantify merch margin versus occupancy to leverage within the 2Q gross margins? And then just higher level, you grew EBIT double digits despite top line declining 20 or so. How are you thinking about the opportunities to grow profits on a smaller revenue base? Any general color on uh, where you see that longer-term revenue size versus EBIT margins? Yep, so, Simeon, there was substantial uh, rate expansion uh, on merchandise margin. Uh, I'm, talk, I'm speaking for LB in total. Uh, substantial merchandise margin rate expansion uh, in the second quarter versus last year, and there was some deleverage uh, in total in, in B&M. So, uh, you know, uh, one was very favorable. There was deleverage. Uh, and, it, and the two effects uh, netted to an overall gross profit, you know, rate that was about uh, flat so to last year, but very significant expansion in merch margin and, and deleverage in B&O uh, related to both the store channel and, and some in the direct channel as well, netting to about flat. And then, sorry, Simeon, what was the second part of your question? Any help on how you think about the revenue size versus even the margin and whether LB or, or either of the concepts? I mean, it was just very impressive to see that EBIT growth despite the revenues declining. Well, we took a lot of actions, obviously, uh, to manage expenses, uh, Simeon, and, and, you know, we, we took difficult decisions uh, about uh, expenses related to the store channel specifically. Uh, and then separately, as it related to home office overheads and marketing spending, we, you know, we, we clamped down pretty hard, as you would expect us to in this environment. And a big part of the result was, was the, the difficult decisions we had to make with respect to store uh, operating costs, including store payroll. But, uh, you know, we're glad that we've been able to reopen, uh, you know, the substantial majority of our stores as we move forward. And we'll continue to manage expenses with discipline. But what you saw in the quarter was, you know, very substantial actions that we took. And I think generally what the industry took, but, but we were quite focused on it and, and tried to make the right uh, decisions for the business to ensure, you know, cash flow and reasonable profitability in the environment. And uh, that's, that's how I characterize it. Great. Thanks, guys. Best of luck for the year. Thanks. Thanks, Amy. Next question, please. Our next question will come from Lorraine Hutchinson from Bank of America. Your line is now open. Thanks. Good morning. I, I wanted to follow up on some of the more cautious comments you made in the prepared remarks um, in, in, in two pieces, really. First, you talked about some capacity constraints. Uh, can you just discuss any efforts that you're making ahead of time to try to enhance your capacity to get ready for these peak volumes? And then second, on the costs, um, obviously, you'll see some incremental COVID costs in the back half. If, if there's any help you can give us on quantifying that. Thank you. Thanks, Lorraine. Uh, Andrew? Thanks, Lorraine. Uh, so in terms of your question around capacity, uh, again, there's, there's capacity in both of our channels uh, in terms of our stores channel and our direct or online channel. On the online uh, channel, we have obviously been experiencing holiday-like volumes really since the start of the pandemic. And what that has meant 
is that we have substantially ramped up uh, you know, our fulfillment center capacity, even while needing to run those fulfillment centers in a way, as we mentioned earlier, very consistent with our overall focus on safety protocols. And as you might expect, that puts some constraints on throughput uh, and, other, and other productivity measures in those centers uh, as we have to apply uh, social distancing and, and other parameters in those centers. That said, we are very pleased with the ramp up in capacity that we have already achieved uh, in both Bath & Body Works and Victoria's Secret. And as we move into the back half of the year where volumes uh, continue to grow, we are also uh, on, on track to increase capacity even further across uh, both networks. So feeling like we're uh, in good shape there, but obviously uh, anytime there's a, there's a concern around uh, an outbreak, uh, that's something we have to monitor and take appropriate actions. And so again, we are cautiously optimistic uh, that, we have, that we have procured and are using capacity wisely. When you think about our stores channel, in some ways it's a similar uh, constraint in terms of the number of customers that we're able to actually allow into the stores at any point in time in order to, again, be uh, focused on safety as our key priority, as well as then our ability to, uh, to process uh, customers through our, our cash registers and, and lines within stores. As we've reopened stores, you know, we, we started off uh, with, I'm speaking now for Bath & Body Works, a, a store opening pilot in late April that put a significant constraint on, uh, on the number of customers we were allowing into the store uh, early in that process, early on keeping it at about 10 to 20 percent of max occupancy. As we moved through the second quarter, uh, we got comfortable with our protocols, uh, again, around safety, social distancing, consistent sanitizing of all the uh, surfaces and products within the store on a regular basis. And that allowed us to get comfortable with raising that max uh, occupancy up to about 30%. But that's still uh, going to be an issue as we move into the height of holiday in terms of how many customers do we feel comfortable metering into the store at any point in time. Also, uh, in terms of a different cash wrap layout, if you've spent time in our stores, either Victoria's Secret or Bath & Body Works, you'll see that, you know, in order to uh, – to allow for social distancing uh, by our associates. Uh, not all cash reps uh, have been, or not all cash registers on cash reps have been able to be utilized. That has uh, caused us to look at more mobile uh, POS cash reps in order to spread out uh, customers and associates in the back of store to allow for that. So again, we're doing lots of additional testing here in the third quarter to simulate peak volume and understand how will that impact capacity and throughput. But those, those are really the, the reasons, Lorraine, for, again, the cautious, cautious outlook as we move to volume levels in the fourth quarter that I, I know you know about our business are, you know, many times two to three uh, to four times higher than what we would normally see in the second quarter. In terms of uh, incremental costs, as one would expect, uh, putting in place safety parameters and uh, you know, personal protective equipment has certainly uh, come with costs in our stores, uh, and we are happy uh, that we have made those investments and happy that we were able to uh, procure all those supplies in a very efficient way, but that does come with additional costs. We are also seeing costs associated with what it takes to then run stores in this new operating model uh, in terms of uh, the level of labor uh, in order to uh, keep, uh, keep customers and associates safe, in order to be able to guide customers through the store, in order to be doing the ongoing sanitation uh, of, of the store and the product, as I mentioned earlier. So that all comes with additional costs. And then uh, in other parts of the supply chain, whether it's in our fulfillment centers uh, that, that we are uh, again, from a safety standpoint, operating differently, uh, including in some cases paying premium uh, pay in order to procure enough labor, as well as as we look upstream in terms of our uh, in terms of our base of supply and in terms of our distribution and logistics network, we are seeing some inflationary pressure there on wages uh, in order to to procure enough labor. 
So that, that's at a high level uh, how I would describe both of those things. Stuart, I don't know if there's any other color you would add, either from a VS or total perspective. No, I think, I mean, as we've talked about together, Andrew, I think that, that covers it, and I just would put emphasis on, you said it, I just put emphasis on the, the store capacity uh, dynamic uh, in the critical holiday period. And Andrew described, described the things that we're working on, and we are really working on them. But uh, our priority is to keep associates safe and customers safe, which gets to metering of traffic and, and sorting out the balance on that capacity in that critical period is key. And we talked about in our remarks that we'll be working to try to spread demand to other time periods to serve customers, with uh, providing them with the things they want and enjoy, and also to just practically spread out the business to, to deal with some of those constraints. Great, thanks guys, and thanks, Lorraine. Next question, please. Our next question will come from Alexandria Wabit from Goldman and Sachs. Your line is now open. Good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for taking the question here. Um, I wonder if you could you know, update us on the plan timeline for um, the closures at Victoria's Secret. Um, and you know, on a related topic, I think you mentioned in the press release that you're expecting to recapture around 30 to 40 percent of the sales at those closed stores. Can, can you talk a little bit about how you're getting to that number? Does that um, uh, is that consistent with the types of recapture rates you've seen historically when you've closed stores? Um, are you planning for that recapture to mostly take place in other stores or, or online? Um, and do you see the, the risk that you know, online traffic could fall a little in those areas as you, as you close stores? So any color on that would be really helpful. Sure. Good morning, and, and thanks for the question. So uh, the, the store closure activity for Victoria's has been largely complete, uh, not uh, fully complete, but largely complete. We remain comfortable with the estimate of about 250 uh, stores uh, closing this year in North America. The, the difference between largely and fully is, you know, we have some ongoing dialogue with uh, landlords, property owners, developers on some of these situations, and so uh, not all those, uh, not, not all 250 are fully uh, resolved, but again, we remain uh, comfortable with the estimate. Um, and an important decision for the business, as, as you appreciate. Uh, with respect to sales transfer, uh, as, as you would also, you know, intuit or understand, there is a range of outcomes. Uh, we remain, uh, comfortable with the 30 to 40 percent. Uh, a portion of that, of the minority portion, call it 5 percent, uh, I'm generalizing, uh, is going to, uh, the digital business. Uh, the balance going to nearby stores. As you would understand, the specifics uh, vary by trade area. So a lot of this gets down to shopping patterns, traffic flows, et cetera, in trade areas. It's how we look at it. And lastly, Alex, you asked if, if the roundly 30 to 40 percent is, is generally consistent with our past history. And the short answer to that question is yes. And so, uh, you know, we've done more testing on this a year ago uh, as we got somewhat more aggressive with closures last year. We learned more. Uh, we had experience prior to that. But, again, what we're seeing is that 30 to 40 percent range, uh, again, uh, expecting that activity to be uh, uh, EBITDA and profit neutral uh, as we move through. And, and we think a healthy thing for the business. We all know what's going on in uh, retailing generally, and for the VS Nuco business, uh, we believe this is an important step, a good step uh, for the long-term health and, and profitability of the business. So uh, that's where we're at. Thanks, Alex. Next question, please. Our next question will come from Jamie Larry Mann from Bernstein. Your line is now open. Uh, thanks very much. Um, as you think about ramping up capacity for e-commerce um, for Bath and Body Works in, into holiday, how do you think about leveraging costs there? Does that put any limits on it? Um, and as e-commerce grows as a percentage of sales for BBW, do you see any investments on the horizon in terms of the digital platform or capabilities that you need there? Thanks. Uh, thanks, uh, Jamie. Andrew? Hi, good morning, Jamie. Thanks for the question. So uh, 
on your first question in terms of the capacity ramp up, uh, obviously we are making any and all investments required in order to procure that capacity. That means working with more fulfillment centers uh, than, than what we had uh, at this time last year or at, even at the peak of holiday. We're already operating with more centers uh, this year than last year by about 2x, and that magnitude will continue as we move through the rest of the year. In terms of, you know, the other investments being made into those centers, obviously I described many of the investments associated with uh, safety and making sure that we have uh, adequate protocols, uh, PPE equipment, uh, as well as labor in those stores. Those are really uh, the investments uh, that we'll be making from a capacity standpoint. From a um, your question around the percent of sale for, for Bath & Body Works Direct and other capabilities that we're looking to add to the direct business over time, uh, I think it's important to, to just reground ourselves on where has Bath & Body Works uh, Online historically been as a percent of the total business. So it finished 2019 at just under 20% of total revenue for uh, for the Bath & Body Works segment, uh, but had been growing rapidly over the past uh, several years. Over the prior five years, compounded average growth rate in the high 20s, and the prior two years, 2019 and 2018, growing at about 30% uh, per year. So already a large and fast-growing portion of the business. That said, as you would have seen in our in our uh, Materials released last night for the spring season to date, uh, the first six months of the year, uh, Bath & Body Works Direct was about 42% of revenue, obviously peaking in the time frame that stores were closed. Uh, but even as the majority of stores have reopened uh, here through July and into August, uh, the direct business as a percent of sales has continued in the high 20s to 30%. Range and that's frankly how we're modeling the business go forward. In terms of capability, uh, you would have noticed uh, that uh, we have added the capability of buy online, pick up, and store. Uh, that is not something that the business had as a capability prior to uh, second quarter of 2020. We have added that into at this point a little over 60 of our locations. 45 of those locations are uh, specifically buy online, pick up and store curbside only. That was a model that we were fortunate to have uh, available to us in California when some stores that had reopened uh, were forced to close as a result of uh, governmental and jurisdiction uh, requirements in that state. So we have been able to continue to operate those stores uh, and are pleased with the results uh, we're seeing. Obviously, stores do more volume when they're fully open as opposed to curbside only, but it is a model that has allowed us to continue to serve our customers and associates uh, safely in those environments. Uh, we do also have about a dozen locations where we have buy online, pick up, and store in addition to being fully open, and we are uh, pleased with those results as well, and we're intrigued with how to roll that out uh, more broadly as we move through the rest of the year. Again, as Stuart mentioned earlier, we do need to smooth volume out uh, from our peaks uh, in terms of peak days and peak time frames, and certainly uh, the, the buy online pickup and store option that allows the customer to lock in uh, her sale but then come and, and pick it up uh, several days later is a key uh, part of the strategy to do that as we move into the back half. In terms of other capabilities, uh, you know, you've heard us talk about our loyalty pilot uh, over the last couple of years. With the pan onset of the pandemic, we have not rolled that more broadly, but we continue to be uh, intrigued and pleased with the results we're seeing there and do believe that we'll take that uh, out more broadly as we move into fiscal 2020-21. Um, and we're also looking at other what I'll call omni-channel capabilities, uh, you know, to, again, more closely integrate our direct channel with our stores channel, and so certainly uh, all of the all of the tremendous surge in business online has has had us accelerate some of the projects that were 
uh, maybe back burner or further out uh, to be faster, and we're intrigued by some of those opportunities as we move into next year. Nothing additional I would highlight, though, for balance of this year. Right. Hopefully that was helpful. Really helpful. Thanks. Thanks, Jamie. Uh, next question, please. Our next question will come from Matthew Tigales from KeyBank. Your line is now open. Hi, all. <clears throat> Thanks for taking our questions. Um, so with, with inventory receipts being down 50% at VS and digital doing well, can you talk about how you're planning the balance of inventory between stores and digital? And I guess ask, ask a different way, how lean can you keep stores relative to what stores were in the recent past and keep the full VS experience for shoppers? So why don't I take a, a crack at that? It sounds like the, your curiosity is mostly on the Victoria's Secret side, Stuart. So, um, you know, over the last uh, several years, uh, the uh, inventory levels at Victoria's and uh, the, the need to promote uh, based on, on consumer response to what we were doing not being as strong as we would have hoped uh, has been high, meaning we've been somewhat overbought. Uh, over the last two or three years. I'm speaking generally. It's varied some by line of business and by category. Uh, uh, with that said, uh, the pandemic actually creates a real opportunity for us in the, in the positive sense uh, to make uh, substantial change in the, the profile of inventory purchases, which we've outlined. That in combination with what we do believe is being closer to the customer and, and delivering better fashion and newness, uh, better merchandising fundamentals around good, better, best uh, uh, basics uh, with Greg, Amy, and John's leadership in those areas as the key uh, merchant leaders in the business. Uh, the combination of those things uh, gives us uh, real reason to believe, along with some, some um, uh, focus on, on getting uh, the cost balance in line, that we've got a real opportunity to deliver good experiences to customers and uh, substantially improve the, the profitability, the merchandise margin rates in the business. Obviously, uh, being appropriately in stock uh, for the customer uh, in core categories and key sizes is, is a fundamental and something that needs to be, and we will remain very focused on delivering a good experience for her so we understand the importance of that. We're managing that well. Uh, but really the, the, the need to um, uh, fundamentally become much more conservative on the inventory uh, buy or the purchases, again, triggered by the pandemic, uh, has a, a silver lining to it in, in that it, it provided a real clarity to the organization about buying much more conservatively and then chasing into business when uh, the trend was was in fact there, so uh, that's where we are. We understand that being in stock is important, but in terms of overall turn in the business, importantly, uh, uh, in certain categories we were turning uh, reasonably well or in, at a level that we were very comfortable with, and in other categories we had meaningful opportunity to improve the turn uh, in the business. And again, the combination of everything I've just described, I think, is going to get us to a much healthier balance between inventory levels and purchases and uh, and the underlying demand. So um, that's where we're at on it. Thanks. Great. Thanks, George. Next question, please. Our next question will come from Roxanne Meyer from MKM Partners. Your line is now open. Great. Uh, thanks thank for taking you. my question. Um, my question is on a Bath and Body Works. I'm just wondering if you can talk about um, how you're planning inventory for the holiday, um, what your ability to chase into trends looks like, and also your approach to the gifting strategy at Bath and Body Works, you know, whether you're going more after package gifts or, you know, make your own or anything big that we should think about in terms of uh, strategic changes there. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Roxanne. Uh, so as you can imagine, uh, we are absolutely going to be relying very heavily on the agility and flexibility that our supply chain for Bath & Body Works uh, allows us uh, as we move into uh, the back half of the year, again, because we, we don't know. It's a very wide range of outcomes uh, that are possible, and so we want to be able to 
absolutely chase to the upside if we're able to continue a trend uh, more like what we've seen year to date, uh, but also use our agility as we have historically to also uh, cut back if, in fact, uh, you know, things don't materialize to the level that we would expect them to. So as a reminder, you know, the Bath & Body Works supply chain is uh, almost – almost fully a, a domestic supply chain, and a lot of it uh, is actually uh, produced right here in central Ohio. And so that gives us, again, tremendous uh, flexibility and agility and allows us to, as you mentioned, you know, really chase into trends. So in, in our vernacular, you know, maximize winners and, and minimize uh, losers or things that, you know, end up performing worse than our expectations. The ability to do that has been a critical part of our historical success, uh, and we're absolutely uh, relying on it already uh, through the first half of the year uh, because we were surprised to the upside in the second quarter. And so Bath & Body Works had originally cut back pretty substantially on receipts at the beginning of the quarter, uh, but we were able to successfully chase back into uh, receipts through the quarter in order to, to meet our uh, demand that exceeded our expectations, and we would expect to be able to use that same flexibility and agility in the back half. In terms of your question around gifting strategy and specific, you know, uh, assembled gift sets uh, versus more open stock gifting, again, I think it's important to, to remind everyone that Bath & Body Works is absolutely a gifting destination for customers year-round. Uh, at any point in time, you know, uh, at the height of holiday, uh, you know, probably uh, 50 to 60 percent of customers claim to be coming in for gifts. Even the rest of the year, that number is in the 30 to 40 percent range. So year-round gifting is something that we focus on for sure at Bath & Body Works, and we see that as a, as a successful driver of the business. As we move into this particular Christmas, I would say, uh, based on uh, several years of testing results around uh, the, the pros and cons of having assembled gift sets, we certainly have moved over the last couple years to having fewer, uh, smaller portion of our business in those assembled gift sets and later, meaning closer to Christmas as opposed to earlier in the holiday season is when that business really peaks. And so we'll continue to rely on those learnings to to impact our flow of assembled gifts in terms of amounts uh, and timing. But again, what that does have us focus on then is ensuring that the whole assortment that's available for customers inside of the holiday time frame is giftable and making that as easy as possible for her with uh, things like uh, cellophane uh, wrap available for all customers, uh, ribbons to, to create gifts. Our associates are happy to create uh, those gifts for you in store, uh, as well as provide you with supplies to do that from home. So uh, gifting in general as much, if not more, of a focus uh, this year than it's ever been. Hope that's helpful. Great. Thanks, Roxanne. Uh, next question, please. Our next question will come from Susan Anderson from B. Raleigh SBR. Your line is now open. Hi, good morning. Nice job managing the quarter. Um, I guess first one clarification just on the performance you talked about quarter to date. Is that from July or I guess from the total performance you saw in the quarter? And then as it relates to VS, it seems like there's some stabilization going on there, though a little bit muddled given the pandemic. Can you maybe talk about the drivers of the performance, I guess, what's working now versus historically, and then the 250 stores you'll close this year? Are there any thoughts around how this is going to impact profitability and the retention rate of sales that you expect either online or at other stores? Thanks. Thanks, Susan. Uh, we'll start with Stuart. So in terms of is, is Victoria's Secret stabilizing uh, – I think in many respects it is. Earlier in this call, we talked about the benefits of a more conservative posture uh, on, on inventory purchase levels, uh, how aggressive we're buying, and how that has an effect on promotional activity. So that's been an important change. It's starting to bear some fruit. 
Uh, I talked about uh, the work that Greg, Amy, and John are doing in beauty, pink, uh, Victoria's lingerie, and the fundamentals uh, that they're um, pursuing in terms of, of merchandising fundamentals, easy things to say but hard to do, really gaining some traction and seeing uh, across all major categories uh, healthy average unit retail growth and meaningful margin rate improvements, which is certainly indication of a better, stronger um, response from consumers with respect to, to what we're selling. Uh, we are uh, implementing a profit improvement plan that we've talked about. A lot of that benefit uh, relates to the Victoria's Secret uh, new co-business. Uh, but with all that said, we got a lot of work in front of us. We're, we're you know, the business's uh, results have declined, you know, substantially over the last few years. Uh, we're not uh, uh, in any way out of touch with reality about where we are. But with with uh, that said, uh, and in the spirit of your question, I sense a real stabilization. And with the combination of actions that we're pursuing and that we've talked about, I see the opportunity for that stabilization, and then for uh, resuming to a pattern of growth, most importantly at retail in terms of top line and margin dollars, again in combination with um, you know the cost uh, rationalization uh, actions that we've pursued. Maybe lastly, and a lot into the in my response, but it all is uh, all these factors matter. Uh, Amy's done important work on the pink brand positioning. John is doing important work on the Victoria's brand positioning. Some of the changes, one might argue, have been subtle so far, but we have indication that, that the consumer is, is noticing those changes, and there, those are important changes, and there's more to come uh, on both those things. So um, we got a lot in front of us. Again, we're not confused about where we are. You put that in combination and operating in an environment that's a pandemic with the effect of closing stores and the earlier conversations around, around store capacity and so on at holiday, but uh, feeling like the business is stabilizing and that we're creating the platform uh, for growth. So that would be my perspective on Victoria's. Thanks. And, Susan, we did say that the closure of the 250 stores we expect to be neutral to profitability. I'm not sure uh, we understood your question about quarter-to-date versus July, or I wasn't sure what you meant by yeah. that. Yeah, just in terms of, you know, it doesn't sound like you've seen any weakness from back to school or anything, like the trends have continued. I guess um, I was wondering if that was from July, just given I think there was maybe some variances from the beginning of the quarter to the end of the second quarter. Yeah, no, we had consistent business throughout the quarter, and that has continued so far into August. Great, thanks. Okay, thanks. Next question, please. Our next question will come from Omar Sark from Evercore ISI. Your line is now open. Good morning. Thanks for taking my question. Um, a quick follow-up on BBW. You know, the plus 87 store comp or the open store comp, you know, obviously we're, you know, we, we assume that slowed as the more and more stores open. I think 98% of the stores are open now. Is there a way you can kind of put some uh, guardrails on how we should think about how the stores are operating? Uh, kind of, kind of on an ongoing basis. And then Stuart, would you mind kind of addressing quickly as you do more BOPIS and curbside the margin differential in those types of transactions versus pure traditional e-commerce? Thank you. Uh, thanks, so Mark. We'll go to Andrew actually for both those questions. Yeah, so, uh, thank you, Omar. In our prepared remarks last night, you know, we, we talked a little bit about, uh, what were the factors that we thought uh, certainly helped benefit the strong uh, positive comps that we did see as uh, stores open. So, so again, to reiterate what those were, obviously when you have a very small number of stores open uh, in the early part of the quarter, as a reminder, we, for Bath & Body Works, started the quarter with only 23 stores uh, reopened in North America. Uh, and we gradually increased that number, you know, by um, about 50 a week through May, a couple hundred a week through June, and then down to about 100 a week through July to get to that essentially fully reopened uh, as we sit here now 
in mid-August. But, but as you would expect, when, when very few stores were reopened uh, and, you know, only a, a couple of stores in each market early in the quarter, we obviously saw tremendously high uh, comps out of those locations as they were drawing from a multiple uh, store trade radius. Um, obviously, in our categories, too, which is a use-up category, where if, if you're loyal to our products, uh, you know, whether, again, that's soap or body care or home fragrance, you tend to, uh, if you're using it every day, go through it in about four to eight weeks, depending on the product category, which means uh, as stores were closed, there was clearly some pent-up demand. Uh, and while some, uh, some customers did move their purchasing online. Many customers waited for our stores to reopen, and so we certainly felt some of that impact as we reopened. And then also, as mentioned, uh, obviously, industry-wide, there's a tremendous demand for soap and sanitizers, and, and so we certainly felt the benefit of uh, being a strong player in that category. All of that said, uh, you know, even as stores were opened for a longer period of time, so specifically stores that, you know, opened late in uh, Q1 or early in Q2, by the end of the second quarter, we were still seeing very strong double-digit comps uh, out of those locations. And, again, that's what we're, what we're looking at and, you know, again, building our upside views uh, to, to assume that what would it take to maintain that kind of a trend while also managing to downsides, uh, again, either based on capacity or if there were to be a change in momentum in the business. On your question regarding uh, BOPUS, I think maybe it's, uh, or buy online, pick up in store, I think it's important to clarify that the capability that I described earlier was specific to Bath & Body Works. Uh, that's the, the only uh, locations right now where we are utilizing that buy online, pick up in store uh, capability. Uh, in terms of your question around what do those the profile of those transactions look like relative to uh, quote a normal transaction again when you're when you're buying online you're doing so through the through the website uh, and then directing the purchase uh, ultimately to be fulfilled in one of our stores but the profile of those transactions look very similar to uh, our our other online transactions our online transactions tend to have a slightly average order size, a higher slightly uh, average order size than our in-store transactions, uh, but in terms of margin uh, or category mix, uh, very similar to uh, a, quote, normal or average transaction. So not something that we would think uh, go forward uh, drives a material change. Great. That's helpful. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, Thank Omar. Next question, please. Our next question will come from Kimberly Greenberger from Morgan Stanley. Your line is now open. Great. Thank you so much. Good morning. Um, Andrew, I wanted to ask about the capacity, uh, store capacity that you're talking about at Bath & Body Works. I think you indicated that um, as a result of social distancing that um, you had capped your capacity at 30% of max right now in Bath & Body Works stores. Um, does that continue into the third quarter? And what percentage of revenue, um, so it's, we understand the foot traffic is at 30% of, of max capacity, but what percentage of last year's revenue can um, that low level of traffic capacity deliver in your stores, I would assume that it's, you know, materially better than that. Uh, but I just wanted to see if you could help us understand how the traffic capacity limits um, translate into store-only revenues at this, at this level. Thanks, uh, Kimberly. So that's obviously a lot of complexity uh, associated with that answer or with that question. So I'll try to I'll try to directionally answer, hopefully, in a way that, that's helpful. So, again, when, when we're speaking in terms of metering uh, traffic or number of customers in the store, you know, the, the percent capacity that we're talking about there is generally a capacity that's uh, given by local authorities around 
you know, what would the fire marshal, for example, say is a safe number of people to have in the store at any point in time. And we've pegged uh, that 30% directionally number uh, due to really looking at what does that allow for in terms of social distancing of associates and customers throughout the store. Um, so obviously in many days uh, of the week and many times of the year, that's not a problem at all, uh, meaning that even at a 30% capacity, we don't, that doesn't create a, a line uh, outside the store at all. But at other times of year, in the peak of holiday, that's obviously what we're looking at and, and trying to figure out. So in terms of that number itself, we certainly will be continuing to test and monitor that. Again, the, the priority is safety, so we're not going to make any changes to that if we think that uh, requires us to compromise on safety and social distancing. But certainly we are continuing to monitor to see if that number is right. The other part of your question was around modeling, uh, you know, what does that allow us to do in terms of covering last year revenue? So obviously in the second quarter, uh, even with those parameters in place uh, and even more stringent parameters in place earlier in the quarter, you, you saw that obviously there was no constraint in terms of our ability to, to maximize revenue in the stores. Uh, traffic into our locations in second quarter was down. Uh, it was down in the high single-digit range. Um, there was some differentiation of that traffic between mall stores and non-mall stores. It was down more in mall stores. It was actually up in non-mall stores, um, driving a, a performance differentiation between those locations. But the other parts of the selling equation were up dramatically. So conversion up uh, in the 30% range, an average dollar sale up in the you know 40 to 50% range. So way more than an offset, obviously, to that traffic decline. And we will be relying on those metrics uh, to continue to drive uh, performance as we move into the back half. You know, the combination of those things obviously means that the dollar generated by every footsteps uh, into our store is up dramatically, up, you know, basically double uh, to last year, if that's helpful. Great. Maybe, Thanks, Andrew. Maybe, Kimberly, just to add on a little bit or to, to, to further emphasize, you're, you're trying to envision we are, how many people can you fit in the store, store safely, right? And, you know, if we think about, you know, in Bath and Body's case, you know, base case, run rate, you know, 40 to 50% conversion rates, right, generally, and at Victoria's, let's say, 30% conversion rates, how do you think about lookers versus buyers, right? And what do you see in terms of conversion rates and dollars per footstep? That's, what, you know, a key part of what we're trying to sort out, what Andrew was describing. And what we've seen so far is a substantial increase in dollars per footstep, right? So it's, it's a complex thing. You're trying to sort out physical capacity in your question, I think. And then there's another aspect of what's the nature of that visitor to your store, right? And what is she doing? And how many people are with her? And what's her intent to buy, right? So it's complicated beyond just how many people can fit in the store. Great. Thanks. Thank you for that color. Thanks, Kimberly. Um, we're running a little short on time here. We have lots of people left in the queue, so let's try to um, ask only one question, and we'll see how many we can get in here. So next question, please. Our next question will come from Jay Soul from UBS. Your line is now open. Great. Thank you so much. Um, my question is about Bath & Body Works International and the partner-owned stores. Um, how are you thinking about the growth potential in that business from the roughly 285 stores or some odd this year? Um, and what countries do you see it from? And is there anything about the separation which will cause a change um, in that business's growth potential and how you're managing it? Thanks, Jay. Thanks, Jay. Um, yeah, so as we've talked about uh, some prior calls, you know, the BBW franchised uh, stores around – uh, the world outside of, of North America is a very nice uh, business model, very successful and profitable business model that has uh, seen nice growth over the last several years. Obviously, the pandemic uh, had an impact on, on that business, just like it had an impact 
on, on all of our businesses. Uh, but similar to the U.S., uh, the, the rest of the world franchise uh, partners uh, are now largely reopened uh, in terms of locations around the world and also were able to very successfully shift the business uh, to online uh, in, in all of their markets as well. So when we think about from a future uh, potential opportunity, again, that franchise model, which is a you know, low, low uh, capital, capital light investment um, with, with a lot of, uh, of potential upside, is something that we absolutely do believe over the next several years we will uh, want to expand further into additional geographies because, again, we have seen it uh, perform well essentially everywhere we've gone. In terms of specifics around that, you know, again, in the midst of, in the midst of, you know, still figuring out 2020 and, and operating safely, uh, you know, we're not going to speculate on what that will be go forward, but, but certainly uh, an important profitable business and one that we do see with uh, growth potential go forward. Thanks, Sam. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jerry. Let's try to get two more in here. Next question, please. The next question will come from William Reuters from Bank of America. Your line is now open. Good morning. Thanks for squeezing me in. Um, my question is just on the marketing savings, how much you achieved during this quarter, and then will you continue to keep your marketing expenditures at lower levels in Q3 and Q4, or since stores are open, are you going to increase them to historical levels? That's it. Thanks. Thanks, Bill. We'll go to store. So short answer is they'll uh, return back to more typical levels. So we we pulled back on a lot of stuff, as you could understand, but they'll uh, return to more normal levels as we move into the holiday period. Great. Great. Thank you. You're Thanks, welcome. Bill. Um, uh, one final question. And our last question will come from Paul Lesway from City. Your line is now open. Hey, thanks, guys. I'm, I'm sorry if I missed this, but can you talk about how the soap sanitizer business performed during the second quarter and, and also what percent, uh, if you look at it this way, what percent of transactions included a soap sanitizer item compared to the first quarter and maybe the versus the same quarter a year ago? Thanks. Hi, Paul. It's Andrew. Uh, so I did mention earlier that we obviously saw very strong performance out of our uh, soap and sanitizer uh, category. Directionally, that business uh, last year uh, on an annual basis was 14% of the business. Uh, in the first half uh, of the year last year, it was in that same 14 to 15% of the business range. And this year in Q1, it was about 25% of the business, and in Q2, uh, a little higher than that. Uh, but uh, in terms of percent of transactions, uh, I don't think that's something we, we historically have, have talked about. But, but safe to say that, uh, you know, customer engagement into that category uh, has been very high. Uh, and so, you know, as it's grown as a percent of sales, it's seen a comparable uh, growth in terms of uh, customership into that category and certainly a business that will remain, uh, you know, very bullish on uh, into the future. Thank you. Okay. All right. That concludes our call today, and thank you for your continuing interest in L Brand. This concludes today's conference. All participants may disconnect at this time. Thank you for your participation on today's call.